Today we have the privilege and honor of welcoming a man whose personal journey and gospel testimony have impacted the lives of millions across the world. Raised as a devout Muslim, Dr. Nabil Qureshi grew up studying Islamic apologetics with his family and engaging Christians in religious discussions. After one such discussion with a Christian friend named David he befriended, Dr. Qureshi began a years-long debate on the historical claims of Christianity and Islam. He chronicled his resulting journey in his first book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, which went on to become a New York Times bestseller, as did his other book, No God But One. And that book went on also to win the Christian Book Awards for both Best New Author and Best Nonfiction, the only book to receive both of these coveted categories. Since his conversion to Christianity, Nabil Qureshi has dedicated his life to spreading the gospel through teaching, preaching, writing, and debating. Dr. Qureshi attended Bio University and graduated with a master's degree in Christian apologetics in 2008. I want to mention Dr. Craig Hazen, the apologetics faculty at Biola, arguably among the finest in the world. Dr. Qureshi holds also his medical degree from East Virginia Medical School and a master's in religion from Duke University, and he is currently pursuing a doctorate in New Testament studies at Oxford University. Dr. Qureshi has lectured to students at more than 100 universities, including Oxford, Columbia, Dartmouth, Cornell, Johns Hopkins, and the University of Hong Kong. His Apologetics to Islam lecture series here at Biola remains one of the most viewed resources on Open Biola. It's open.biola.edu, check it out. Right, come on, shameless advertisement. Dr. Qureshi has participated in many public debates around North America, Europe, and Asia. In 2014, Christianity Today included Nabil Qureshi as one of 33 under the age of 33 in its cover story on emerging young leaders in Christianity. His recent books have included Answering Jihad, A Balanced Examination of Jihad, The Rise of ISIS and Islamic Terrorism, and No God But One, Allah or Jesus, both books released in 2016. Now, Bill Qureshi is a busy man, but recently he has had to step away from speaking engagements for a season as he's battled advanced stomach cancer. On August 30th of this year, at the age of 33, Dr. Qureshi wrote a courageous post on Facebook announcing his cancer diagnosis, and here's part of what he wrote. I do not profess to know the will of the Lord, but many of my close friends and confidants are convinced that this is a trial through which the Lord intends to bring me alive and refined. May his will be done. And may I invite you to seek him in earnest on your knees, fasting on my behalf, asking our Yahweh Rapha for healing in Jesus' name. And as you pray and fast, he said, quoting Paul's letter to the Philippians, I will rejoice for I know that through your prayers and the help of the spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed at all, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Nabil, I don't know why you're facing this trial, but I do know that it's obvious God is at work through you at this pivotal time in your life and in our world, to speak the gospel with credibility, to speak about the one truth God in a globalized world of to each their own spirituality. There is a greater impact still for you, and I am trusting God for your full recovery and healing, and I ask others to join me as we pray for you through this cancer journey. And given your significant cancer treatments, we did know that if you would be joining us for commencement, it would be a great thing, but we weren't so sure you'd be able to. But though you probably said no to 99% of the invitations you received in recent months, you said yes to this. And it's remarkable that you are here with us today. And I know your words will impact us deeply. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me 
and our 2016 commencement speaker, Dr. Nabil Qureshi. Well, cat's out of the bag. I wasn't going to bring any of that up. Um, it is an absolute honor and privilege to be here. President Corey, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, to the faculty and staff here, thank you so much for what you do. Uh, you have shaped me. I was one of the students sitting in these seats in 2008, uh, the 100th graduation ceremony. And um, what, because of what you have done, uh, my life has been changed forever. And I'm looking at the students, um, and I'm thinking, man, uh, you guys have been through it. <laughs> Class of 2016, give yourself a round of applause. You have spent enough sleepless nights studying, working on papers, taking exams, eating enough in and out burgers. Uh, you have made it to this point. Um, and it is a milestone moment. What you're experiencing today, you will remember forever. This moment will stay with you forever. And so rejoice. Take the time today to really savor the moment. It doesn't come again. Graduating from this degree will only happen today. For many of you, it's your undergraduate degree. That will only ever happen once. And so enjoy this day with your family. Enjoy it with your friends. Savor it. Journal it. Pray to the Lord. Thank him for it. Uh, this will only happen today. Now, I want to pray before we get started much further. Um, I was gonna go a different direction with this talk, but since we let the cat out of the bag, um, I'm going to share with you what's on my heart. So let's invite the Holy Spirit to come once again. God, you are king everlasting. You ordained this universe. And through your breath, you spoke it into existence, the word eternal. And you purposed for it to be as beautiful and as wonderful as it is. And as much as you set galaxies into motion, you place stars in the sky that will burn for millions of years. You placed planets and solar systems in the universe that we could never begin to fathom, millions of light years apart from one another. God, as powerful as you've made the cosmos, you put your image on us. And as much as we can spend our lives chasing the perfect sunset or spending time behind the most beautiful waterfall, Lord, you look to us and you say, we are your prized creation. God, thank you so much for loving us so deeply. Though we are so frail, though we are so broken, though we rebel against you, you love us beyond anything else. God, you are amazing. And Lord, I know that each of my brothers and sisters here in these seats, just as I was, God, that you have purposed for them to be here today. That you have crafted them. And God, I pray that you would emplace upon them an indelible message right now. Not any words that I would share, but the message you would share. Holy Spirit, may it descend upon people's hearts now. May people encounter you in a way that will leave them unchanged now and forever, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the scripture that I gave to you is from 2 Timothy, chapter four. This is the last chapter that Paul penned before his execution, are you with me? He is staring death in the face, and he's thinking, what is the legacy I'm leaving behind? And he looks to his student, he looks to his disciple, Timothy, and he charges him, now this is the culmination of a life lived for God. And he says to Timothy, I charge you with this because you are gonna carry this fight after me. He says, I charge you in the presence of God, of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Always be sober-minded, endure suffering, 
do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. I wanna take those last three words and aim them right at you. Fulfill your ministry. Now you might have gone through this program, you might have gone through this degree as if it were just the next step. You went through high school, you go to college next, you get your degree next, and then you're looking to the world and thinking what comes after this. What I want to share with you is that God has placed you in this world for a specific reason, for a specific purpose. The work that you have done in the past four years is not incidental to who you are. It's not something you just happened to go through so you could get the diploma. It has shaped you and crafted you to be a world changer, to go out there and to make this world a place where heaven invades earth. Because look, this world is constantly dying. That's the way the universe works. If you think of it from a physics standpoint or a chemistry standpoint, think of the law of entropy. The universe starts ordered and it moves slowly towards disorder. Some of you have cleaned your rooms and then a week later said, what happened to this room? (laughs) What happened was the law of entropy. It moved from order to disorder. And that's exactly what's happening in this universe. Everything is going from life when God infused this universe with life to death. That is what's happening in this world. And you have been placed as the hands and feet of Christ in this world. What does that mean? Think about this for a moment. When Jesus came into this world, okay, God, the one who infused this world with life, stepped into it because we kept destroying ourselves. We kept killing ourselves. We kept launching wars. We kept oppressing the weak. We kept taking from the widow. We kept destroying ourselves as humanity. And so God says, out of his great and tremendous love for us, I am going to enter into this world. And he takes the leper. Now understand, lepers in society would never even be touched. They had to walk around saying unclean, unclean, unclean because their leprosy could spread. The death that they had contracted could spread to others. And so they weren't even allowed to walk around in society. They wouldn't even get hugs from their family. Can you imagine going five, 10, 15 years without getting hugged by your family? That was what it was like to be a leper in society at that time. And Jesus, when he walks into the situation, notice what he does. He reaches out and he touches the leper. Why? Because instead of death going from the leper to Jesus, life flowed from Jesus to the leper. Are you with me? Women who were bleeding couldn't walk around in society. They had to be outside. They were ceremonially unclean. And one woman bled for 12 years the shame she carried upon her because she was walking in the midst of crowds not telling anyone she was unclean. Deep shame for disobeying the laws of her forefathers. Jesus sees her and instead of contracting uncleanliness from her, he passes on to her life. He feels the force of life go from her, from him to her. And he re-infuses her with life, reintroduces her to society. He gives her her life back. If we want a literal image of death coming back to life, let's think about Luke chapter seven, where a dead boy was raised because Jesus, when he touches, instead of death passing to him, life passes from him to the dead. But then he says this, and this is powerful. He says, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers out into his harvest field. And when he does that, he then multiplies. He takes everything he's been doing, preaching, teaching, and healing, and he passes that on to the disciples, and he says, now you are my hands and feet into this dying world. You I commission. Just as I bring life into this world, I'm going to sit at the right hand of the Father. Now you bring life into this world. That is your calling. That is your ministry. And the disciples even though they were uneducated, even though they were not the ones people would pick, because of the 11 disciples who Jesus trained to bring life into this world, you and I know Jesus today. Because of their work, they changed the world. 11 uneducated men. Now look around at what you see around you. 150 of the most elite, trained, and educated men and women in the world. And I say that without any amount of exaggeration. If you've been to university, you're more educated than 1% of human history. And you've graduated from a degree from one of the most prestigious institutions in the world with the heart of Christ behind it. You have been trained and equipped 
to be a world changer, to infuse this world with life. Now you're thinking, Nabil, I got a degree in finance. Or Nabil, I got a degree in business administration. How am I supposed to change the world? No, God is going to use you in that capacity to spread life, to spread his truth, to combat death. You know, the eternal life that we get by knowing Jesus, and by the way, for those of us who might not know Jesus in this room today, this is the truth, that God entered into this world to pay your burdens for you. By dying for you, you can know God forever if you just accept his payment and follow him. Eternal life awaits all of us who have accepted Christ. But what I'm trying to tell you is it doesn't start when we die, it starts now. You know God, the eternal king, now. You can introduce life to others now. That is your purpose. That's why you're alive. That's why Paul says, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Your ministry. What is your ministry? Why did you get the degree you got? And it wasn't because you flipped a coin. It wasn't because, oh, you just wanted to. What does Psalms tell us? It tells us that he who loves the Lord, the Lord gives him the desires of his heart. Did you get a degree in art? It wasn't an accident. The Lord gave you that desire. Are you gonna become a pastor? Great, we can all pastor others. We can all reach this world. And that is who you are. Don't forget who you are. You're not an accident. And when you go out into this world, you've been under the covering of Biola University, a phenomenal place to learn and grow. But I'll tell you, the moment you leave these walls, you'll be thrust into a world where the prevailing paradigm is pointlessness, is meaninglessness, is death. Might as well eat and drink because for tomorrow we die. That's how most people see the world, whether they know it or not. And some of you in this room might still see the world that way. What am I living for? I'm telling you, the reason you're alive the reason you're a child of God is to spread life into this world. Now, I'm looking out and I'm praying with all my heart that one day I will see my daughter in one of these seats. But I charge you I charge you as if you were my son or my daughter. Do not live this life thinking that you are just a person. You are an adopted heir, a son of God, a daughter of God, a prince or a princess, sent to combat for the kingdom in this world of darkness. And you can bring life with the words that you speak. You can bring life as you reach out to the people in your workplace Courage and conviction, what a powerful theme. Yeah, if we were gonna die and go to the grave and that would be it, what point is there to have courage and conviction? No, you can go into enemy fire. You can go into lands riddled with Ebola. You can go into sex trafficking trains and not worry if they will kill you because you have eternal life. He has already overcome the world, take heart. And here's the thing, here's the thing, here's where it gets magical. My doctor said to me that I have a 4% chance of surviving five years. And I said to him, you don't know our God. God is able to do immeasurably more than you ask or imagine. And you look at yourself and you think, what can God do with me? Let me tell you, he took the cross, which is the worst thing that has ever happened in human history, Think about it, the death of God at the hands of those whom he created, the people he loved, hating him so much that they flay him and kill him. He took the worst thing that ever happened in human history and he turned it into the best thing that ever happened in human history, our salvation for all eternity. If he can do that with the cross, how much more can he do that with you? How much more can he do that with you? You think, I have sinned, I have made mistakes, Nabil, you don't know what I've done. I don't care what you've done, our God has done more to save you, to redeem you. And you can introduce his miraculous hope into the world. And yes, I say miraculous hope. Because what Jesus did is not over. People are still being healed. People are still being saved eternally. People are still encountering a miraculous God even today. 
Do you want to live just a normal life? Because when other people graduate from other universities, they're just thinking about jobs and they're thinking about the next step. I want you to think about your identity as a child of God, a conqueror of the grave, an eternal life to spread life into this world. I charge you, brothers and sisters, fulfill your ministry. You were created for much more than they say. And now I release you. Well, first you gotta get your diplomas. <laughs> but I release you into the world as Jesus. Christian, little Christ, that's who you are. I release you into this world. If 11 disciples could change the world, how much more can we? Be full of joy, love one another this day, remember that you are children, sons and daughters, prince and princesses of the king. May God bless you, thank you so much. Dr. Qureshi, thank you. On behalf of this throng of students here graduating, the faculty, friends, witnesses, uh, you have breathed hope into us through the power of the gospel, and we are grateful. Thank you. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything, from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.